are the women we've come to drum. We are the channel between the earth and the sun. We hold the wisdom of the ancient ways. We will bring peace to these troubled days. Welcome to Visionary Vegan Woman. I'm your host, Kate Follow, and I created this exciting event designed to empower women to step into their highest spiritual destinies, embody their feminine power, and answer the call of their souls when it comes to helping the earth and all her beings. This powerful paradigm shifting conversation will inspire us to heed the call of our souls to be unstoppable in the face of fear and steadfast in holding the vision of the future we so desire to see manifest. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today. I'm really excited because we have we will be speaking with a very inspirational lady and she's very funny too. <laughs> Her name is Lauren Toyota. Welcome Lauren. Hi, thank you so much for having me for this. Yes, we're so excited you're here. Um, so Lauren Toyota is one of the most inspirational, influential voices in Canada. She seamlessly transitioned from close to 10 years as a national television host and producer to an independent self-made content producer for more than eight successful social channels. From YouTube to Twitter to Instagram, Lauren has hundreds of thousands of combined followers, fans, and subscribers. Currently, she's devoted to creating authentic and engaging creative content, content on her YouTube channels, Lauren in Real Life, and Hot for Food. She also recently released her first vegan cookbook, Vegan Comfort Classics, my favorite, mm -hmm. 101 Recipes to Feed Your Face, which instantly become, became a bestseller. Lauren recently hosted a 10-day vegan retreat in Bali with the Getaway Co. called Live With Purpose which focused on her vegan lifestyle and spiritual growth. Expanding on this offering, she released the Live With Purpose online meditation program with Natalie Matias. Beautiful. I love it. So your topic today is manifest your life, which is beautiful. And awesome. I love it. Um, so how, let's just get right in. How, how did going vegan guide you to, you know, spirituality and a spiritual life? Well, I think that the, the sort of idea of spirituality was part of my life earlier than that, um, I would say, as a adolescent, without having any like context for it, like without understanding what that meant, or having a language for it. Then I became vegetarian, eventually became vegan in my 20s. And I think it's I do think though that it's when I went vegan, when I, for me, I may, was making sort of a physical body connection. I was feeling sick all the time, didn't know what to eat. Every time I ate, felt sick. You know, in the back of my mind could hear this echoing of like, stop eating animal products. Because <laughs> uh, I had flip flopped from vegetarian to not my whole life or most of my life. And so when I finally made the decision and started shifting into a vegan diet, I started physically feeling so much more alive and in alignment and healthy and all of that stuff. And I think naturally what happens when you do that is you go on this journey where you've just sort of like opened a portal, opened a door to something and you don't know what that is, but without you even realizing because you're no longer eating animals or contributing to a cruel lifestyle, you inevitably, inevitably become more, um, compassionate and more awake and more aware of all these little nuanced things. And so by way of me aligning my physical body, it, it inherently transferred into sort of a, an alignment with my emotional self and my mental self, like the whole mind body soul connection. And so I think that it really was this big door blowing open for me to then access, I suppose, like this more spiritual self aware side or aspect of myself that I was aware of in a small way as a kid, but hadn't fully tapped into. And I really do think that going vegan when I did January 1st, 2010, like I transitioned over a couple months, but like that was my date that I was like, there's no turning back. That is like this distinct shift where like everything changed. And gradually then over the last nine years, nine, 10 years, that spiritual aspect of myself or this higher being of myself just started expanding at like a very quick rate. 
And then I, you know, this all happens over time, but you start making these connections and you start noticing. It's just like you just start noticing things and you can't, it can't really be stopped. It's like there's this momentum behind it that's bigger than you. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I, I felt like I had the same kind of like awakening, spiritual awakening. And I too got, got vegan. I went vegan in January <laughs> as well. Oh yeah. Um, January 7th, I believe, 2016. Awesome. And I remember the same thing happening. It was like, it was like, just like everything sped up. And I really felt like there was something deeper and bigger happening. Dots were being connected and I, you're just so much more aware and the energy, the physical energy was crazy. You know, I was like bouncing yeah. off the walls. Yeah. Yeah. And I just felt so liberated from within because like, I felt like those shackles on my heart that had kept me like, kind of like dim, my light mm -hmm. dim and so for so long, like just finally had the freedom to be, you know, be truthful and be aligned with what I really, really desired and, and you know, wanted for the world. So yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's beautiful. And um, so I guess, Let's talk about maybe some mindful mindfulness practices that you mm. you do and um, some rituals. Mm. Those have become a lot more um, not complex, but those have become more of a thing, I suppose, in the last four to like five four to five years. So I started like formally, like actually meditating in 2013. So went vegan in 2010 and then found an actual meditation practice in 2013. So there was those three years there where it was about food and it, it wasn't even about a full vegan lifestyle. It wasn't even about like my shopping and my clothing and my beauty products being cruelty free. But by the end of that three years, it was. So it sort of took those first three years to kind of get to that place. And then it was interesting that by that point, then I had found meditation and Meditation was really the uh, the second gateway, I suppose. Like it was something that, again, as a kid, it, as a teenager, I knew what meditation was. Like I watched Oprah; she was sort of my guru or whatever. And kind of anything relating to like the spiritual world was like mirrored by Oprah and understood because I watched the Oprah Winfrey show and she spoke in this way that resonated that I hadn't otherwise heard. So. And I read Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukav, which was one of the first sort of spiritual teachers she had on the show. And he talks about meditation. So meditation was, again, in my awareness, but hadn't been something I like started doing until 2013. And when I did, again, it was like this like very clear, like click on moment that was like, oh, like kind of again, like, oh, here's another portal. Like, here's the next step in this journey that you're on. And, um, so that was the first thing I just started doing that made sense. That was easy to access, uh, that started, you know, again, I like your language, you know, bringing the light more to the surface, like opening that up, expanding that. And I could, then you really, again, it's kind of this like visceral, physical and emotional experience. It's all the things again, but you know, you feel it, you start feeling something going on. And then there's this like bigger awareness that sort of like layers outward that you start connecting to. And so that experience was then something I was like very, um, I don't know, kind of blown away by. Uh, and so I started meditating mostly daily and in terms of what I do for meditation, it's kind of changed over time. I'm kind of someone who doesn't actually, like a lot of people, if they talk about meditation or meditation practice, I've found most people have sort of this very rigid, consistent practice. Like they either do TM or they do like a certain modality and they don't stray. But I found a lot of fluidity with it. And that's sort of how I learned when I first meditated from um, some women that I had uh, been at a retreat with who sort of the first guided meditation I ever had they had a very easy approach to it like about doing what feels right you know not necessarily subscribing to any one modality and like really exploring like just going on this exploration so I started doing that and I found just like doing different meditations made sense for me there's so much free content online you know, there's no excuse. Yes, there are apps and things like this that can keep you on a schedule if that's more how you operate. But I like to kind of wake up and see how I feel. And then like, I just sort of gravitate or I have an impulse to like listen to something or I find or something finds me. I feel like 
the internet with the way it is like something will find you in the exact right moment. And then that's just the meditation I do in the morning. So even in the last, you know, shorter term, it's become a daily practice. But again, the thing that I actually do isn't always the same. Um, on top of that, you know, I found again through this exploration and this first meditation retreat I participated in, there was sort of an, um, a way to just, they, they, they sort of showed us like, you know, tarot and crystals and all of these little tools that are like, if anything, they're fun. Like they're not meant to be taken super seriously, but again, when you start noticing things and you start paying attention more and you start noticing signs and signals and synchronicities, you notice that all of these tools are kind of facilitating that because I think they're coming from, you know, a bigger place, a place of more intentionality. And like, they start to like help you kind of line up with what your sort of, you know, intentions are and whatnot. And so tarot and crystals and I don't know, smudging and tuning forks and like any and all things I'm like super into because I feel like they're just reminders for me to be more mindful, to make sure I'm feeling aligned again, mind, body, and soul. And, and, over these few years, it's become so strong that it, I started noticing that like, this is where, you know, who I truly am comes from. Like it's coming down. It's like being downloaded. It's like creativity is just like so much more accessible and like easy when I'm in that space. And so it's like making those connections for me over the last five, you know, few years, five, six years that if like, I don't know, it's all just created this, very clear like web and it's then a place I can access. I'm, I'm of course not always there. I'm, I'm sometimes flustered and have anxiety, like having a panic attack, you know, like we all go through these various things, but this is the thing that anchors me and I can come back to. And I know that I can soothe myself and heal myself by just sitting and, and breathing or listening to a, a meditation or, you know, whatever or pulling a tarot card, like then it allows me to just come back to who I actually am. I love that. Um, I just pulled tarot cards right before we <laughs> jumped on this call. And, um, and I also did a shamanic journey, which was helpful to kind of just, you know, tune back into the truth of me and, and what I really truly desire to create for, for the world. And, and, um, I always set an intention before I come onto a call like this. And, you know, usually it's generally it's about being of service and, and helping the animals. Yeah. Helping yeah. Them. But, um, you know, yeah. what's funny before we, you know how I, so I didn't know this was a video call. So I was sitting in my pajamas, like didn't look like this. And, but what I did do is I sat here for 10 minutes, um, meditating <laughs> because that's all I cared about. It was like, what am I going to say on this thing? You know? Who are we helping? What are we speaking to? But I hadn't, I completely obliviously forgot about that you're taping this and what it should kind of look like. And, you know, I got ready really quickly, but it's like, that's the thing. It's like that to me now is the thing I do. I don't worry about the other things. Yeah. Cause the other things fall into place just like they yeah. did with us. I mean, yeah. it was the 10 minutes to yeah. get ready and, and here we are. And yeah. you know, you're more prepared than ever, than you would ever have been if you didn't meditate and the same exactly. with me. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about meditation um, and maybe some misconceptions about meditation and how you have addressed them in your own practice. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think one was kind of what I addressed about like this idea of routine. I think people won't even take the first step because they think, well, I can't stick to it. So why even start? I think the same applies to exercise or even cooking. You know, they don't want to even start or the, the, the sabotage is there or the saboteur is there to kind of prevent you from even starting because you think you won't even see it through. But the thing with any of these activities or these desires for something better is that you just have to do it once. You just have to take a small step. And so that's one thing. And two is that when we think about meditation, we automatically have all these sort of taboo perceptions about like what it looks like, what meditation is supposed to look like. You're supposed to be sitting like cross-legged with your hands in a mudra and you're supposed to be extremely still and your spine extremely straight, like somehow in some pristine environment, uh, <laughs> you know, 
you really got to get rid of all of that. It's all just sort of like superficial imagery that is associated with like being spiritual. And I think like that, none of that applies. Like maybe you will find yourself a spot in the house that you can then turn into a meditation space, but that shouldn't be the reason that you, you don't start because you don't have that. And again, meditation can be anything. Meditation can also be cooking, um, painting, you know, everyone's already doing a lot of what is being asked of you in formal meditation. You know, if you're focusing and you're kind of allowing something to move through you to create something, whether that again is a, a meal or a painting or a garden, you're in a form of meditation. You're in a form of focus. And, um, so, you know, I just sort of advise people to get out of their own way with that and kind of realize, A, you're already doing a lot of these practices. But what I have found is that with sitting still, there's sort of an extra added bonus or benefit or awareness that comes with out the sort of physical activity of drawing or cooking, but just sitting with the breath because you're going deeper into the layers of who you are into that awareness, right? The other misconception is that meditation is supposed to somehow have you control your mind and get rid of your thoughts, which is an impossible task. And that's not what it is. I think anyone who practices meditation realizes this early on and is taught this from whoever they're learning from is that you're not here to get rid of thoughts. You're here to observe the thoughts. If we think about how often we're distracted all day long, we're really not paying attention to our thoughts at all of those layers and deeper, deeper levels. And once you have this awareness of the thoughts, then you start seeing how active the mind really is, how, how important some of that information can be. And then you do get to kind of pick and choose and control what you allow to sort of become a more, more of your focus. Once you know how many, like, you know, hundreds of things are going on at any given time, then you can decide which ones are of benefit and which ones are of not. And use that focus that you practice over time and build a habit around to kind of zero in on a little bit more, which sometimes can mean, you know, a visualization meditation, which is kind of like a, a way of meditating or, or doing something while you're meditating that allows you to focus. You don't have to do that all the time. And I would, I would also encourage like not doing it all of the time so that you become, um, attached to that idea or like, you know, you think that that's the only way you can do it. Again, this, this exploration, I think being open to not thinking that you have to do something one way every single day at the same time forever and ever and never change. It's like, you need to do what's good for you. You need to find what resonates for you, what works for you and switch it up and try different things. Like I, I'm still like, although I meditate, I'm, I feel so like, I don't know, beginner, at the same time, because it's like, I'm just always learning and finding new things. And I think it should constantly be like that. And I know if I were to stick to like one way of doing it, um, I don't know. I think a, I get bored B, (laughs) I don't know. I just don't think you can, there there's, you're missing out on information. You're missing out on other, other things you can access. So, you know, other people may disagree saying you should master, you know, master something, but in my opinion, I don't think meditation is something to be mastered. Like, you know, I'd like for myself anyway, I kind of had to get that misconception out of my head about that, that there's a, there's somewhere to go with this, that there's some place to get to with this, that I'm going to become Zen or enlightened. Like I, I don't, I don't like talking about any of that kind of stuff or even trying to like put that in my own brain because naturally I think humans, we get competitive and we get, goal oriented and we especially type a people like me and i'm sure you we get into our we get in our own way with that stuff and meditation isn't in my opinion supposed to be like that but it can very easily quickly become that and almost defeat the purpose of it in from the you know from where it started so it should be much more free and fluid um, than i think sometimes we are we are told or if we read an article about it or if we watch someone else doing it and we start comparing or aspiring to that we start getting in the way of what the benefit of it is i love that that's so important for us Mm -hmm. to know and i agree i mean why not you know have little tastes of all the different kinds of meditations and you know i can get obsessive about it yeah 
course, um, you know, having these grand visions or something, and if I'm doing it a certain way, but there's something to be said for just the sitting and watching the thoughts. And, you know, just the other day, I think it was last week, I got mastitis. And so with that, like flu symptoms, because I'm breastfeeding, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I didn't just get mastitis like out of nowhere, but, um, and I was forced to lay down on my bed in the dark because like the light was just too much for my head. And I was like, and I really didn't want to, I had a lot of resistance to it, but at the end of the day, and I, of course it started with, you know, all the negative talk, all the, all the, all the, you know, self criticism and the badgering and all that stuff. But slowly but surely I watched as my thoughts I kind of started to like push them into a different direction and ultimately I got like these amazing downloads for my website and for <laughs> different things and I was like wow I wouldn't have gotten this if I hadn't been forced to sit in the darkness of my room being still which you said you know there's value in 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 doing it all different ways but of course the stillness, which goes kind of against our nature, mm -hmm. um, you know, is there is value and real value in there because you're sitting and you're actually you're making space to receive. Whereas when you're doing your, you can miss a lot of things. Totally, yeah, and I know distinctly what it feels like to be in both of those places, right? Like I know sort of my life before meditation and my life now, and I, and I see the differences and I feel the physical differences and the emotional differences and the ease that comes when I do allow that space and notice. It's not about getting rid of negative thoughts. It's about noticing the negative thoughts and like you're saying, the badgering because it's almost like, and I got this sort of vision of you like sweeping, like you're just sweeping those thoughts away. Like you're like, great, I see you. And I'm going to like put you in the dustbin and we're just going to put them over here. And it's like, you do have that. You are able to get that mastery of the mind to a degree when you practice more and more because you're fully opening and accepting of all that is there. But then I get, like I kind of mentioned earlier, it's just like, but you get to choose what takes over. Yeah, and we so often forget that that it is a choice. Yeah, even in our day to day life, like not even in meditation, just daily life. Like, yes, to be happy right this moment. Like, I'm, I forget that all the time. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are great. This is great. So, how do you apply the same mindful perspective and the spiritual perspective in being an entrepreneur? How do I maintain that perspective in being an entrepreneur? Yeah, and how, well, how do you apply? Oh, yeah spirituality and mindfulness as in your life as an entrepreneur? Well, I think again, I feel like the moving toward that perspective in life prior to being an entrepreneur is even what allowed me to be the entrepreneur because it was definitely a block for me um, kind of all my life. Uh, I feel like there was this elusive idea of running a business or, or being an entrepreneur that I learned about in high school. I, I, I took art and business in high school. It's like where I found my two interests, which don't even necessarily sometimes often go together. It's like you have to be this artistic person or you have to be this like level-headed business person. But I sort of enjoyed both. And you're kind of conditioned to think, you know, that – you're never going to run your own business. You're going to work for someone. You're going to follow these rudimentary steps and do this, this, and this and get here. And that's it. <laughs> so I, I, I was, I always had that sort of story being told or even me telling myself that story and really thought I wasn't smart enough to run my own business, but I wasn't like savvy enough or creative enough, like all of these things. But I think that adopting this new perspective or shifting my brain to see the world in a different way is what allowed all of this to kind of manifest because it was always like something I wanted. And again, I didn't know how or what it would look like. Um, but again, once I got into that space, this aligned space, it was bound to sort of come through uh, cause this really is what I meant to do. And I truly have feel that doing it, even though prior my TV career was something I always thought I wanted, 
it was like this dream, this like desperate dream I had as a teenager to want like be on television and be on this music channel and like meet bands and do interviews and perform in this way that I didn't even know where that was coming from. And again, that was like all a catalyst for me getting here, but I quickly got over that dream. Like once I was in that, it didn't really feel like the right thing. Like it, there was something off about it. Like I knew it was a step, a stepping stone, but it didn't feel the way doing what I do now feels. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, this again will shift and evolve as well, but this feels so much more, I don't know. You. It, yeah, it feels so much more <laughs> me than the other kind of dream did. Um, and so I guess, again, just like applying, the, like doing the things I said I do, like the meditation, like to me, that's important to operate this thing. Um, it's kind of like there's me and there's the business and the mission. They do go together and they're linked, but I have to like, I have this, this, this mentality now that like my job is to, um, you know, maintain myself. My job is to perform maintenance on myself so that then the business can do what it's supposed to do or the message can get out in the way it's supposed to get out. Like, again, it just has this bigger than me feeling, which in a lot of ways, truthfully, is easier and takes a lot of the pressure off sometimes. Of course, I still have meltdowns. Like, look, don't get me wrong. But... <laughs> in the big picture and what I'm talking about right now, to me, it's so clear and makes sense. That's just, it's just like, it's bigger than me. And so there's a lot of stuff I can just not worry about. Like I always talk about when it comes to manifesting and creation, like I refer to um, what Mike Dooley says, who um, writes a couple books like infinite possibilities. And he's, he talks about thoughts become things, but his main thing is like get, um, avoid worrying about the cursed hows. Like you need to know why, but you don't need to know how you need to know why you want to do it, what you want it to feel like, but you don't need to know how you get there. And like that reminder all the time helps a lot. Um, so I think I bring these little pieces and I apply it to like business because business is like anything. Everything is a spiritual practice because like we were talking about earlier, it sort of comes from within and goes out. So as long as you maintain that perspective, like an inward perspective with an outward inevitable outcome or manifestation, it becomes so much easier. Yes. Really. really. Because if, but if you're, but if you come from like maybe a traditional mindset of business, or I feel like kind of what maybe I you learn in school is like, it's kind of goes the opposite. It's like outward. It sees like everything's outside of you and bigger than you and unachievable. You know, it's just all at all times. It's just about like working on yourself and everything else just then starts to sort of snowball outward. Yeah. And speaking of this, like just manifestation mm -hmm. business, I feel like also totally what you're saying. Um, and also maintaining that vibration of joy and like, because that vibration is what's going to attract more of that joy. And just like you said, it's just so much easier. Like you don't have to put in the, the sweat and the tears because you're literally just sitting there relaxing and seeing in your mind's eye what you would want to be. And you're feeling that feeling of mm -hmm. what it would feel like when it's already here. And then the, the universe just like draws it to you at like a magnet. It's just... <laughs> It's amazing and it's yeah but we're and look i i practice this i'm not the like i always just want to reiterate like i am not a master at this it and none of us are we are just doing a little bit more each day we're practicing and ingraining these habits more and more because i still want to effort i still want to like work 15 hours because I think I got to get this thing done. And like, I still do that. It is like so default mode, <laughs> but it's about trying to break this down a little bit more. And, and I've done it. I have done it. There have been so many ways running this business that I have achieved it in that easeful way. And then I see it and then I go, okay, this really does work. Can that inform the next thing I need to do or that's coming to me so that I don't have five meltdowns on the floor I have one <laughs> because it's it's just still so 
again, like defaulted and programmed in us to work the opposite way you were just describing in the way I was just describing. We, we think that we need to, to effort our way to something. Again, I listen to Abraham Hicks and she uses the analogy of like swimming upstream versus like paddling against the current versus just going with the current. And so it's like, that is what I'm just trying to remember to kind of move toward every day. Yeah. And it's the more so I do that, the better things that happen and the more easy they feel and the better the results of what I'm creating are and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's so, so much more of a feminine way too, which totally yes. just is so unfamiliar or um, unfamiliar with because it's so been so suppressed. Um, and just, we are scared of it. We are not used to it. It's very uncomfortable. But once you do see the results, like you were saying, like, and you're just like, oh, it does work. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going well do this a little more. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that. And like, obviously it's the topic of, and the crux of your whole summit here, which I love and why I resonated with it, because I feel like since I started on this spiritual awareness journey, path, exploration, something that's constantly come up for me is this idea of the masculine and feminine and having an understanding that, of course, everyone embodies both of those energies. But I myself am super aware that the male energy has been on overdrive like my whole life, my whole life. And it's come up in readings and meditations and journeys and things that I see. It's like, it's it always feels like there's this internal battle of both. Um, it manifests as a physical thing, like on my right side, which is the masculine side. And in the way of my intimate relationships outplay and all of this stuff. So I'm always trying to be, again, aware of that feminine energy, that the feminine energy is sort of like how everything <laughs> is birthed and how everything really operates at its core. And yet we've been, you know, this masculine idea or this mask has been sort of placed on the, on the earth, like on the consciousness of the earth and in the way we all are, are told and taught and conditioned to, to play this game. And I have, we have to break it down. Like I do it all the time. I'm constantly like that. Like I even always, well, I mean, I'm just going to get more detailed, but it's just like, Sometimes I just feel like I'm like the, like I, I have, I'm a, like a, a man, like a mask, like at this thing, it's like a disease, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or like soften, yeah. like it's so hard for me to soften. And look, it comes, it's, it's a benefit sometimes, like that more fiery masculine energy alpha thing is like a benefit in a lot of ways. But I think I would benefit more if I could start cultivating the more feminine thing. And I, look, I still, I know I'm feminine and I feel feminine also, but what I'm saying is that one just sort of speaks louder a lot of the time. Yes. And I hear you and I'm yeah. just, the audience members can totally relate. Really- <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of, I guess, the more masculine aspect, you've been highly visible and like you've carved out a leadership position within the vegan movement. So how how was putting yourself in the spotlight something that came, was it something that came naturally to you or did you have to work at it more? Um, I mean, you mentioned that, that you had this desire even when you were younger to kind of be on TV and all that, but just maybe for some people like more like myself who are more introverted and are shy and, but do want to, you know, step out as a leader in the movement. Like, are there any tips you could give them or suggestions you could make that would help ease that transition? Well, that is, that has been like a really um, strange evolution because I also, as a kid was extremely shy (laughs) and had social anxiety and was not a performer, you know, in public at school, I just like, I was like in the corner. I was quiet. I got picked on because I was so quiet. Like you become that target, right? So that wasn't really my natural way of existing in the world, but I did always have this awareness of like, it was deep in there. The desire to be more outspoken or to say what I really thought or, or to say something. I didn't know what I wanted to say, but I, 
I knew I wanted to say something, which was why I had this like pull toward television because I grew up watching these sort of quirky people on much music in Canada who were kind of, you know, being themselves and, you know, no apprehension, no holds barred, just kind of like putting themselves on display for who they really were. And it gave me permission to kind of connect to that. That's where that came from. But all along, nobody knew that that's what I wanted. It's not like I did drama or anything like that in school. Like never, never, never. I hate, I disliked all of that. So I wasn't this ham or anything, like trying to get attention. But I had this like inner thing that was like pulling me to like want to be on a platform where I could say something but didn't know what I wanted to say. So that's been like a, that has been like a lifelong evolution. And I guess in terms of like, tips on how to do that. I think, I do think that like, whatever is meant to be shared by you will be shared again, if you are cultivating from within first. And it doesn't always mean that the message needs to go onto these traditional platforms or these through these channels in which we think this is the only way to get a message out through the media, publicity, television, radio, you know, that's what we've come to just sort of think is the only form of mass communication or social media. But I think there are just, there are so many ways in which something can be unleashed onto the world, right? That perhaps it isn't, it isn't everyone's um, thing to, to speak on camera, you know, but you can make a piece of art that then says that same thing and it goes out in that way. And I, so I think there's like, again, infinite ways in which those messages can be shared. So that's one way of just kind of, thinking about it differently. Um, And for me, I guess like early on as a kid, it was just, again, by, by being bullied and picked on, it forced me to pay attention to this inner voice, which I'm thankful for because some people may have this thing of like, what do you, what's my, like, what do you mean inner voice? But like, I always had this inner voice that was just like speaking to me um, in those moments of like true sadness and like isolation. And I think that more extreme version of isolation is what forces it to come through sometimes. Maybe not all the time for everybody, but that's kind of what happened to me. So I have to think that that's like, you know, the way and the reason why it had to happen that way. So I just always had this inner voice, like just sort of reassuring me and telling me, you know, this isn't it. Like there's so much more than this. Like don't even pay attention to what's going on right now. Like this idea of like, it basically told me to just live in the other reality, like the vibrational reality, the reality in which I was this person. So that's what I did. But that is a tip in that the idea of visualization and just acting as if, like if you are really shy, but you, again, if you, if you're resonating with what I'm saying, like you feel this like inner sort of like energy in you that like wants to be out there, spend some time in meditation, just like envisioning yourself doing that speech or that talk or that thing, um, as though it's happened or is happening. Cause the more you can embody that being, which is your true being, it's an aspect of your true being that's there waiting to kind of come forth. And yet all the fear of what people are going to think and say and all the failure and all that is what's just speaking louder. But if you can sit in that space of like seeing yourself differently in that vibrational world, like this other reality that exists for you, the closer it can start to sort of silence those other thoughts. Like we were talking about, like sweeping that out and bringing this more forward. And when that's more forward in your mind's eye, it literally then comes forward here and like, before I even started talking to you today, I was thinking about it again, like how I wanted to get this across because when I was a kid, it's like, I really, again, I didn't know who Abraham was and I didn't know what the law of attraction was and I didn't know any of this stuff, but I was doing it. And it was by way of this inner voice, just like being slightly louder for a longer period of time for me when I was a kid that just allowed me to like live in this fantasy world where I was on television, like saying stuff and like connecting with people. And again, giving people watching me the permission to be themselves. So it was like, I just, I just had this desire to be more of myself, like who I knew I was inside, not the person that all the bullies like thought that I was. And I have to say, you do such a good job of giving permit by being 100% authentically you in your videos and everything. 
you really do give permission to others and, and you're such a role model for that because I mean, even for me, I remember, so of course, you know, uh, the same thing, it was an evolution, like, you know, getting here was an evolution. I started, you know, in the vegan movement, I kind of started making how to recipe videos and like just helping my friends, family, community, that kind of thing, posting pictures. But I remember watching your videos and you would just come onto the screen with just this like, just like no BS, like this is me, this is who I am. And, and it gave me the power to do that same thing. And so, yeah, thank you for that. And well, sure you've done that for so many other people. Like, you know, you can mess up, but you don't care. You laugh about it. You know, you don't have to be this cookie cutter girl sitting there like a robot, you know, making these, this food. And it's so much more fun. It's so much more awesome to watch you. And, um, and it's so inspirational, really. Um, well, thank you. I mean, I appreciate that so much. And really, it's like why, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to say. When I say I didn't know what I wanted to say, but I had something to say, it's not even that I had something to say. I just had to, I just wanted to be <laughs> more of me. Um, so I'm really glad that, uh, whatever, that that, however that happened, <laughs> by whatever, you know, methods that happened, you know, being bullied, being shy. I mean, those were all the reasons in which this became a thing. So yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm really, that like touches me a lot. Cause that's like, that is all I wanted to do was just give back that thing that someone else gave me the power to recognize. Right. Yeah. Cool. So cool how that works. Well, you're yeah. doing it. You're doing it, lady. So, can we talk a little bit about your food? Because it's just yeah, I yes. can't not talk about your food. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did you realize that making this ridiculously delicious vegan food was your thing? I feel like there's just been again this like lifelong inner thing where it's like I was always meant to do this. I was always meant to be vegan too because um, I grew up. I grew up just like being aware of food. You know, my mom made my baby food. My mom shopped at a health food store. You know, I was always reading labels. I was just always curious about like what the food was, where it came from, what's in it. And uh, always been into cooking and making my own food because of that. And, um, you know, even when I was vegetarian, I was sort of forced to make components of my meal while like my family made like the rice or the vegetables, but I like took care of the the meat alternative aspect of my meal. So I was always experimenting, but it really like, it didn't really take off till I went vegan because going vegan caused me to have to get way more resourceful. And it was through the transition of going vegan that I, I started to kind of, again, align with these misconceptions of what being vegan was that like I somehow had, I thought I had to eat raw or I thought I had, you know, I did think that I thought well, I can only eat raw food <laughs> or like steamed vegetables. Like you just get in your head about like, you're just so limited in the way you think about food, which I totally get when because people ask me these things all the time. And so it was through that transitional phase. And then the early couple months of my going vegan that I, I just, was like, uh, I'm not gonna enjoy this and I'm not gonna stick with it. So I gotta change that. Like, how am I gonna enjoy this and actually stick to it? I wanna eat cheese, I wanna eat meat, but I don't, you know? But like, I, but that's what I wanted because I was craving this stuff. So I had to figure out the substitutes and I had to figure out how to like, just make things so that the texture was right and the creaminess was right and the fat content was right. And I found a lot of the stuff I was finding, buying at restaurants or finding online, just kind of all fell flat there wasn't enough flavor there wasn't enough fat there wasn't any salt and there wasn't enough like warm cooked comforting stuff so that's what then just like made me start making comfort food because I was always watching diners drive-ins and dives and Guy Fieri's show on Food Network and all these Food Network shows but mainly Guy Fieri because I say he was like indirectly like the full influence of hot food food I didn't even realize till I sort of looked back but I was like no this entirely influenced how I started making food because I would just see how they were making this like awful food in these restaurants. But like at the end of the day, making sauces with like lots of plants and spices and then putting it on the meat stuff. So I was like, okay, well let's do the same thing and put it on vegetables and put it on tempeh and put it on tofu, you know? So that show informed like how I cooked and the amount of like ingredients I knew I needed to use in order to make something taste exactly the way it did before I went vegan. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you've had a really hard, like what was the hardest thing to recreate or veganize? I think for a long time it was the cheese because there were just, I mean, in a very short amount of time, um, the whole community has come a long way. And like, I never say like, I invent, like, I didn't invent anything, but I did take existing ideas and like really elaborate on them because I found that they weren't that great. And like in a short amount of time, the recipe elevation in this community has like skyrocketed and it's amazing. And I think we're all learning from each other. And so the cheese was something I always found like, A, didn't have enough tang, didn't have enough flavor, wasn't smooth enough, wasn't creamy enough, all of these things. Like it just wasn't hitting all the notes that it needs to hit like on the tongue. So I, I found like that was hard to do at the beginning. And so I just, that was where I kind of, I tried to focus energy on like cr anything creamy and anything fatty. So it was like creamy dressings, like Caesar ranch and then like cheese stuff. And that's like where the cheese sauce came from and like the fettuccine sauce and like all that stuff was like, I think like the, the crux of where I put my energy. Cause like those were the things I wanted to feel in my mouth when I ate, like that I was, I don't know, being comforted. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And what about on a weeknight? What's your, what's your favorite thing to cook at home? Well, I'm a total byproduct of just whatever the content is. So it's like often I'm shopping and cooking for the content now and for hot for food. So I eat whatever's left over. So usually I'm just like pulling different parts together and making some kind of bowl with it. Um, uh, it tends to be a lot of carbs, as you know, from hot for food. So what I'll actually do is I'll take like a bit of, I'll always add more greens. Like it's like, I would never shoot it that way necessarily. And mind you, like I still have like healthy recipes and stuff, but when I'm cooking like all bready noodley rice stuff at once, which tends to happen, I have to like cut that with like more greens. So I'll make up a bowl, but I'll add like way more kale or like whatever greens I have in the fridge as the base. And then like put the pasta on top or put the rice thing on top or put the bready thing with it. It's usually just a big mishmash of like whatever's in the fridge, which is like sort of where that series came from recipe where I just like make it up because I, I was so overwhelmed by how much food I had left over that it needed to use it up and I wanted to change the way it looked and tasted. Yeah. So I do. That's how I eat really. Yeah. That's fun. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I guess my last question would be, what does it mean to you to be a visionary vegan woman? Well, it's sort of the whole mission. It's sort of the, it's like the life mission at this point. Like it's so um, like natural. Like again, it's nice that the, the idea of being that person or offering that into the world is the default mode. Like we're talking about how our default mode is to come from effort and all these things. But another default mode is just that like I am vegan. I don't think about it. You know, I don't, it's just who I am and it's natural, which I do like. So it's like everything I do will always have this underlying intention, you know, to be as cruelty free as possible, to make better decisions, to live a more holistic existence for me. I mean, really for me, but the byproduct again is then it sort of has an outward ripple effect. But at the end of the day, it's for me. And I, rem I, I do remember that daily. Like it has to come from here. It has to come from inside. It has to resonate with me. And then everything else doesn't matter because it takes care of itself, which that. is nice. That's why this whole thing has worked, I guess. That's why it's reached so many people and resonated. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it's, it's really cool. And I'm constantly amazed. But then I just, I do have to acknowledge. It's like, well, you're doing it. You're doing the work. You're setting the intention. That's all you need to do. And then it will work. Yeah. And I think it's really important for our audience members to remember, like, because we can get into this idea of, like, you know, focusing on ourselves is selfish or, you know, um, yeah, basically selfish. But, you well, know, because we're talking about veganism, we're talking about animals. So we tend to go to that place, yes, of like, it's not about me. It's about the animals. And again, everyone has different meanings to that. And when it's said that way, I start to see it from a different place that I disagree with because you know, it's like, actually it is really about you first, 
but like, what do you hold to heart here? And what do you want to offer to the world? It benefits the animals, but like, you do have to think about yourself first. So I am a big proponent of this idea of selfishness and we have such a negative connotation with that word. But what we mean is that like, it all just has to come from you and you got to do the work and you got to get in alignment and you got to like have the vision and you got to hold that in here. And like I said, like the rest is automatic. So I'm helping the animals, but am I, am I sitting around looking at tortured animal videos all day? Am I sitting around like worrying about the woes of the farm animals all day? No, because that's not helpful. But I know that like what I'm doing, because it's coming from this pure place, is like, it is directly attributing to their well-being. Definitely. Over time. I mean, God, it's like such a huge thing. That's why I can't focus there because it will prevent me from doing the work. I'll become so overwhelmed by the, you know what I mean? By how impossible it seems to make a difference if I focus on this. It's again, for me, it's, I'm so visual. So it's like, it's too hard to focus on like the crowded factory farm vision because it's, it doesn't feel good to look at that. And it, feels like it's we can't do it we can't yeah. do it one yeah. just ourselves by ourselves and we can't do it in this amount of time so yeah focusing on that is definitely not yeah. going within holding the frequency of what mm -hmm. brings us joy and you know helps us to unleash our light is where we need to be turning our gaze yeah and then all day every day you know i hear the stories from people or even just like encounters with strangers where I may not have a direct influence on that, but because I'm being told these stories or these examples, I'm like, to me, I make that connection that like, great, it's reflecting back to me what I'm doing and what my intention is. Cause I do hear great stories all day of people making changes in their lives when it comes to this kind of thing. And so anyways, it's that reflection that I notice. And then I'm like, okay, great. I'm on the right path. Like those are just the little clues that like, let me know that like it is working. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you. yeah, you have an amazing gift for our audience members. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? I do. I uh, have a bonus uh, book called Even, Even More Vegan Comfort Classics, um, which is bonus recipes to feed your face. So it's very similar to the cookbook, but it's a little small PDF ebook package of 15 recipes that haven't been released anywhere else. Um, so there's like vegan pecan butter tarts and a Vietnamese um, pho bowl with vegan fish sauce and like really unique recipes that just didn't make the cut for the book. So you all get that free gift to click and download and use in your own kitchen. I'm going to be clicking and downloading right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks Lauren. Um, Thank you. You're an inspiration and I'm just so glad we were a part of this global event and um yeah i guess have a beautiful day thank you i can't wait to see this all come together it's so exciting so thanks for offering this yes yes my pleasure yeah. okay bye bye